cover the concepts of oh nope web sockets so with web sockets this will be a very brief lecture uh because i don't think the concept's that complicated but it's worth going through i want to talk about uh the traditional way that we have web clients talk to web servers and that's through http and i want to compare that to another approach that you're going to do if you haven't done it already in lab 14 which is web sockets so we will, uh, and so WebSockets provides a lot of things we cannot do with the HTTP model. So first let's talk about HTTP and some of the limitations about HTTP and AJAX calls. AJAX is just asynchronous JavaScript calls. So we know that HTTP is a request response protocol. We know that our asynchronous JavaScript that we've done, the fetch request that we do, allows you to do these HTTP requests response within a page, within our web pages. But it's still just a request response, right? So, uh, and what that means is that a client always has to initiate the communication to make the request, right? So the server can't update a client if it has new information. That's not how HTTP works. Uh, servers only provide responses. So it's always on the client to initiate that communication. So the question then becomes, what if you want the server to be able to push information down to the client? So say for example, let's say if we want the server to push a new email or some new news or notification or send updates to like a shared uh, uh, real-time chat or like a drawing canvas space or being able to send game events like characters that are moving around. Like all these are examples where the server has new data that the client would want to have, but we can't do because of the limitations of HTTP. It always has to be the client that requests that information, even if it doesn't know yet that that information is something that needs. And so there are workarounds for this. Um, one of the common workarounds you'll see is one that's called polling. The concept of polling is that the client will continuously poll the server for new information, whether it's, it's there or not, because uh, it doesn't know if it has new information, so it's just gonna keep sending requests for as long as you have that uh, web page open. So you can think of this as the web client sending a request and it gets back a response, no new information. And then maybe some updated information happens here. So the next time it sends the request, it's like, oh yeah, I have updated information, here it is. But then it updates again, right? So there could be a lag, it's not, it's not a perfect, this isn't a perfect, and in fact, you can see how data could fall out of sync very easily in this way. This is one kind of workaround using HTTP. Another workaround is the same concept, but it's called long polling. Long polling is essentially the client sends a request, which the server does not immediately respond to. In fact, it doesn't respond to it until it actually has something to send or until the timeout, uh, the, the, the timeout uh, uh, time occurs because it can't hold the connection open forever. Anyway, so if something comes along to send, it completes the response and the client will immediately send a new request over to the uh, client. Uh, or if the requested timeouts, then it'll just send the client back some, some response. So the way that this works is you can think that the client sends a re uh, request. And so here the server is gonna send and wait and hold that request until there's some updated data and then send it back as a response when it finally happens. And then it'll send a request. Again, it's still polling because immediately after it gets that response, there might be new data. So it's gonna send in a new request and it can sit and hold on that request until some amount of time happens and then it sends it back. So again, these are the two approaches that you can kind of get quote unquote real time data from your server using your traditional HTTP model. But you can see clearly both these are deficient. Both these are not great solutions. They're hacks. They're effectively hacks to try to force a two way connection in a protocol that's really designed as a one-way connection and one that's just a request response model. So introduced with HTML5 was a concept of WebSockets. WebSockets provide us a true two-way ongoing communication between a client and a server. It's essentially a safe version of a TCP IP connection for the browser. Uh, so each side can send messages and each side has a listener to do something on a message. So WebSockets are in fact not restricted by the same origin policy that HTTP uh, uh, protocol is. So it is up to the server to check the origin header and decide whether it should reply or not. So just a quick comparison 
based off of the graphics I was showing you earlier in your traditional HTTP model where you initiate a connection by HTTP and then you get a response and then you send a request and you get a response and you send a request and you send a response. This polling model I showed you in a WebSocket model, you would initially uh, you initiate a connection to a WebSocket and then that opens an ongoing connection between your client and your server and the server can just send data whenever it needs to. You don't have to go through that, that uh, hack of polling for data from the client. And so one nice thing about WebSockets, I mean, they've been around now for, I want to say, uh, they say it's a new technology, but they've been in browsers for at least seven years now. So all browsers support them. And in fact, they're natively supported by browsers in the global window object. You can, in fact, go ahead and if you wanted to, uh, part of the uh, standard library inside the browser is a WebSocket uh, class. So you can initialize the WebSocket, you pass it a URL, and notice here, the URL to a WebSocket, I'll, I'll cover this in a little bit, uh, instead of HTTP protocol, we use WS or WSS protocol for WebSocket. So anyway, you send it to the URL that has a socket server, a web, uh, WebSocket server. And then once you have an instance of a, of a WebSocket on your client side, you can send, uh, um, so when the WebSocket is connected and ready, so when, once it opens, you can give it a callback function. In this instance, our callback function will be to send the initial message to the server in that WebSocket. And then we can also have handlers where we give it a callback function given some event, and then we can log that event that we come that comes back through the WebSocket. So the data that goes between the web client and web server happens through the WebSocket. We can push data uh, in or we can get data back out by observing that socket. And again, this is built right into our browser if we wanted to do this, uh, uh, use pure WebSockets. So WebSockets on server side, so if I want to implement WebSockets on the browser side, this is how I would do it. If I want to implement WebSockets on the server side, well, it's not built into the core module of Node. So we would need to have a third party module. The most popular third party module for pure WebSockets uh, is uh, WS. Uh, and that just creates a new WebSocket server. It defines handlers for, again, the on connection and on message, right? The same two methods that we have in the browser side to be able to send or get data back and to be able to send messages to the client. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the WebSocket protocol here. So the URL prefix does not use HTTP or HTTPS. HTTPS is uh, secure HTTP. Uh, it uses either WS or WSS, WS for WebSocket or WSS for secure WebSockets. And then the rest of your URL that goes to your uh, WebSocket server. So an example of how this protocol might actually manifest itself when you send in a request. So all WebSocket um, initializations happen as an HTTP request. So let's look at what that HTTP request actually looks like to initialize a WebSocket connection. Notice we would do a GET. The GET would actually use that WS, right, the WebSocket URL. And notice it's going to request to do an upgrade to WebSocket in the connection type. And it might have like a WebSocket key, right? It can establish a cookie. So this is our general uh, uh, request header that we have. And then when the server gets this request, to upgrade from an HTTP connection to a WebSocket connection, it will send a response, right? A success uh, response, let it know it's doing this handshake and that the upgrade is on WebSocket. And then it'll do all the management stuff it has to do for the WebSocket. So the important takeaway here is that all WebSocket connections initialize as an HTTP request and they get elevated to be an ongoing two-way connection. And once, once after that handshake has completed, that HTTP connection is then broken down. So no longer an HTTP connection is replaced by that WebSocket connection. And then over the same TCP IP connection, uh, the upgrade is just one way. You can't go back to HTTP. So once you disrupt that connection, once you break that connection, uh, you, it, can't, it can't be converted back. It's always a WebSocket connection. Okay, so let's talk briefly about Socket IO. Socket IO is what you'll actually use for WebSockets inside of Lab 14. Uh, inside the WebSocket lab. Uh, Socket.io is a library uh, that helps uh, implement on top of WebSocket. So it makes building WebSocket applications much easier. 
So it's a library for that full duplex communication between clients and servers. It's built on another module that's called Engine IO. You don't have to know this. In fact, uh, this is a lower level uh, uh, implementation on top of WebSockets. And then Socket IO is a high level implementation built off of this lower level implementation. And so it's an abstraction uh, that helps define your transport methods between the browser. And so the nice thing about Socket IO is even if you have a browser that does not support WebSockets, it will replace it with lawn polling. So you can rely on Socket IO to essentially provide a reliable two way uh, uh, connection between your client and your server. So, uh, so, so uh, Socket IO also provides a simple abstraction for event based programming across both the server and multiple clients. It allows you to broadcast to more than one client if you need to. So, clients can emit events back to the server, clients can listen for events from the server. The server can listen for events from the clients. The server can emit events back to the client. The server can emit events to other clients, or the server can broadcast uh, emits uh, broadcast events to all clients. Let me change that so it reads more cleanly. So let's use like a uh, a D and D analogy of how Socket IO might. Um, might manage a connection of, uh, of clients. So imagine if our socket IO server were like our game master. And imagine if the game master has to manage a multitude of uh, players who all have a collection of data that they have to update based off of what the uh, game master tells them. So you can think of each server, each web server, uh, at each socket server right as the table where a game is created you can think of the events that are shared between the players and the game master in this instance the clients and the server as simply words that get passed that have meaning uh, it can obviously be accompanied even with short phrases uh, you can have one person again who is your game uh, master who listens for events from the players from the clients and then emits an event to either one client they point to them and say roll a die or do this action or they can broadcast an event to everybody who is part of this game who's part of this table to all the other clients uh, the rest of the table are clients who can emit events to the server so they can request something to happen from the game master or they can listen for something from the game master and respond to it. And then clients or the server can generate events at any time. And clients cannot emit peer to peer. So everything has to be relayed directly through the server, through the game master. OK, so let's look very briefly at just a quick methods overview of our uh, socket IO module that we could potentially use. So you have. Um, the on method, which is going to uh, get invoked when the connection is first established. And again, we pass it um, uh, or, or when this message comes through. So on this particular uh, message event, we would call this callback function. And then we have an emit method where uh, we will emit a message with this name. And this is the parameters that go along with that message name. So this would be like the equivalent of the source message or the data relevant towards this event. And then the events uh, that are pre-built are a connection event. So this is an event that is this defined when you first create your connection. A disconnect event. So each time a client disconnects from the server triggers a disconnect event. And then the rest, besides having a connection event and a disconnect event, all the other events that are defined in a socket uh, server client setup in a WebSocket is defined by the developer. So you can make very complex event names that get passed from one end to the other. So it's 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 very adaptable, and you'll get a, a flavor of this uh, in the a very a very easy flavor of this in the lab. But for those of you whose full stack applications rely on real time uh, data transfer, this is the way to go. 
Okay, and yeah, this is, and so again, with the socket emit, this emits back to the client. And then you could also do socket.broadcast.emit. This emits to all connected clients except the socket that started it. So you could do an emit to broadcast to everybody from the server side, whereas you could do um, to all other clients except for the one that uh, originally sent this, uh, this message to the server. So that's just the distinction between these two methods. And we usually, I think we just use the emit call inside the lab. We don't really have a use for the socket broadcast emit call, but know that that is a thing. And so, okay, let me show you, I have 10 minutes so I can give a quick rundown of what this code would actually look like. I'll give you a simple demo of a chat application and I'll walk through that code right now today with you. And then I think what I'll do tomorrow is I'll actually give you an example of what a more complex code base might look like using WebSockets and kind of walk through the code of a, uh, of a monster catcher game. So you can see how you could have a more diverse of uh, a developer defined uh, of uh, uh, messages or events that get passed on a WebSocket. Okay, so let's go to what the code for the lab is going to look like. So our lab code, again, this is gonna be a very short lab. I would be surprised if it takes more maybe an hour for you to complete. In fact, if I look at the package.json, the only thing that this lab's going to require is uh, is Express and Socket.io. Right? These are the only two technologies as a proof of concept to build a, uh, uh, a true real-time chat room between a web client and a web server. And so here, let's take a look at what our, uh, let's start actually by looking what our HTML is going to do. So on the client side, notice we'll have our HTML document, the head all is producing a title. So a tab title that will say socket IO chat. And in fact, I guess I can run this to uh, show it to you. I'll show it to you after I'm done running through the code. Um, and then I have an unordered list which will have the ID of a chat room, and this is where all the messages of our chat will go into. We'll have a form, which will have a input field. This is where the user will be able to type in a message, and there'll be a send button. So we'll do probably a um, on submit uh, event listener that will look for data in the input form, and then probably send that to the web server to get added to, or the um, the socket server, the web socket server, to get added to every connected user's uh, uh, unordered list inside this 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 chat element. And so notice we're going to have two scripts that get attached to this. We're going to have a socket IO script, and this is going to be one that's delivered to us specifically from our socket server. So the socket server is going to establish a connection to its uh, its distinct uh, socket connection by using this script. And so this will go ahead and provide to us the socket IO module that allows us to connect to that socket. And so we'll create just a chat.js uh, script that allows us to connect to this socket IO module. And so let's take a look at that. So the first thing I do is I get an IO function that initializes my, um, my socket connection. So I will invoke that function and I will bind it to this variable that I'll call socket. Then initially, I'll just go ahead and grab some of these HTML document elements so I have access to them in my JavaScript. So I'll query the DOM to get the form element, the input element, and that unordered list, which is the chat element. Then on the form, I'll go ahead and add an event listener that on a submit event, whenever someone hits the button, I will go ahead and pass that event. I'm going to prevent the default. The default on a submit event typically goes ahead and redirects you to uh, some kind of uh, follow-up page. If we want to prevent that, all we want to do is send the information. Then we're going to check if that input actually has a value. So if the user hit the submit button and there's actually a value in the submit button, then we will emit that message. We'll grab that value and we're going to give it the event name of chat message. So on this socket that we established here, I will invoke that emit event. So this is going to send the event from the client to the server and it's going to send it to the client as a chat message and it's going to send it with the parameters of that value. So that's just a, uh, that's just a uh, string. And then we will reset the string to be blank. So that's what we will do every time we submit, uh, hit the submit button. And then 
we have this other thing and we'll, we'll see what this looks like but we'll read it now and we'll come back to see if we need to uh follow up on this again so uh the other thing we're going to do on the socket besides emitting an event of a chat message we'll also listen on that socket so we'll listen on the socket whenever a chat message event occurs we will invoke this callback function that's called a pin message this append message takes in a message right so we're passing it this callback function we're not invoking it right we're binding the callback function to trigger whenever we hear this event on the socket so essentially this is event handling this is the same way we 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 manage events for the graphic user interface we're just manage them through the socket so anyway we bind a callback function the callback function takes the message so this is a parameter that will be associated with the chat message right we can see that here when we emit it and then uh, we will access our chat, that's our unordered list, the inner HTML, to add to it a list item that contains that message. And then the last thing we're going to do is we're just tell the window to scroll to the bottom of the page. That way, as the page fills up, all this does is to make sure that it defaults to uh, displaying the field at the bottom of the page as opposed to the top of the page. So if I look at the HTML, I'll have this unordered list, and then I'll have my form. So I never want the, uh, the user to have to scroll down uh, for the form. I always want the most recent set of messages and the form to be the thing that's on the bottom of the page. And that's just what this last line of code does here. It just tells the window object to make sure that the uh, browser scrolls down to the very, to the height of what the body of the document is. Okay, so let's take a look at our app then. So what are we doing with this app? Well, uh, we're going to do a lot of the things we've seen before. We're going to build out our Express application, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll import the Express application and then we'll actually invoke it to have an app. We'll import the HTTP module and we'll actually tell the HTTP, uh, HTTP module to create a server and we'll pass it the Express application. And now we have a server object. We need to have a reference to the server object because when we import the socket IO package, right, from Node uh, using NPM, we will pass that server to the socket IO function and the socket IO will bind the web socket to this web server. So now this web server is both, it has a, a we'll call this IO. So IO is now our socket server. So now we have a server, right? That we can respond with HTTP requests and a server, the IO server that can respond or upgrade to a web socket connection. So then with our express app, we will use a middleware to say, hey, express, um, act as a static server on the public directory. Okay, what's that public directory? Let's see if I can take a quick look at that really quick. Let me open this. What's going on here? Oh, cancel that. Uh, okay, so let's see. What is the uh, project uh, hierarchy here? I have that app.js file here. That's my express app. This is the node modules that get installed by the package.json. I have a public. So I want to make this public uh, folder exposed publicly by a static server. So anything inside of this can be served to any Git request as if it were a GitHub page, as if it were uh, uh, defined as a static uh, as, a, as, as a static file. That means I can go ahead and do a Git request on index.html. I can do a Git request on this chat.js, right? Anyway, so by doing this, I can now host those all as, a, as a basic web pages. Then on my WebSocket server, I want to, on a connection event, invoke the onConnection uh, uh, method. So this will be my callback function. And then the last thing I'll do is I'll just say, oh yeah, my uh, web server is listening on port 3000. So let's see what this onConnection does. This onConnection, the first thing it does is it does a console log to say, oh, a user's connected. And then it's going to look for, on a socket, so on this socket that gets passed that that it has uh, that it manages, it's going to listen for disconnect events and chat message events. Remember, this is emitted from our chat JS, right? That we emit a chat message. So this is a user defined. This is a developer, I should say, defined event. So on this event, I will invoke on chat message as my callback function. On a disconnect, that's one of the two events that are pre-built in. The other is connection. I will call the on disconnect callback function. The on disconnect callback function will just invoke the console.log user got disconnected. And the on chat message will take that message parameter that got passed. It will console log that on the web server. And then it'll emit it to all connected clients to 
emit a chat message event and then also pass that message. So then all of those connected clients will, again, on their socket, get this chat message event and append that message. And then if you just wanted to see what this looked like running, I could go ahead and run this as a proof of concept. Uh, let's see here, let's go here under demo. Let's go to services, uh, new terminal and folder. And let's do, uh, I'm going to start for this. Okay, so we're listening on 3000. So now let's go to a new window here. Actually, let's do a um, incognito window. Should never close it up. I'll just open that other one. The incognito doesn't want to open on me. Okay, whatever. Okay, so let's go to localhost 3000. See, a user is connected. Perfect. Let's go here as well and open up another tab. Two connected users. Perfect. And now here, let me refresh. When I refresh, that'll uh, disconnect, right? So, user got disconnected. And okay, so uh, starting to lag again. Hopefully that does not. Let me go over here. Okay. Okay. So there, the hello is there. And if I go back onto this other tab, oh, I disconnected. Let me reconnect here. Hello, world. Okay, hello world. Now this was already connected, so I refreshed, made a new connection, broadcast my hello world on my other connection here, which then updated this client, but it also updated this client as well. So I had my original message of hello, and this got the hello world from the other client. And so that's an example of how we can use a WebSocket to create a WebSocket server to broadcast multi uh, uh, message or data between multiple clients that are connected simultaneously. Excellent. Is there any questions about WebSockets? And that'll be just a, again, a simple little short lab. Did all this make sense? At least conceptually? Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you had networks, you could see how to take something that you probably did in Java and, uh, and essentially do it similar to uh, how that would manage, but in, this time in um, in JavaScript. So for those of you, again, who need chat rooms or need some kind of real-time communication between different users or between the web server and your client, this is now how you can do this. Oh, yeah. Well, this is much simpler. Uh, also notice that this will probably take the complexity of what you do in Java and networks and make them uh, uh, ridiculously simple. This is why we. Uh, this is why JavaScript is a uh, popular um, technology stack to build uh, distributed web-based applications in. Okay. Well, with that said, I will end this lecture here. And uh, if you need me, uh, please uh, contact me on Discord.